All right, get out your King James or Geneva Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 4. No, this isn't going to be part of the Temple series. Uh, this sort of kind of popped into my mind. So, this is uh, Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is the light and the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So when John Hagee says that the uh, you-know-whos over in the Middle East have a secret back door without Jesus, well, either John Hagee is right or and Jesus is a liar or Jesus is right and John Hagee is a liar. Well, God said, let every man be true. I mean, I'm sorry. Let God be true and every man a liar. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. So, let God be true and every man a liar. And that's John Hagee. Oh, and me too, by the way. Yeah, so. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Huh. So is Adam the Lord? Or did she think she got a, a blessing from the Lord? Or did she think something else is the Lord? Good question, right? And she again bare his brother Abel. Now, the best uh, Bible scholars that I can think of say that this seems to indicate that they were twins. So, they know Hebrew better than I do. Matter of fact, I know very, very, very little Hebrew. I know a few words. That's it. And not even uh, spelled, just the spelled pronunciation and the sounds so and she again bear his brother Abel so you got Cain and then Abel and Abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground and in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of a firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But, uh, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his, his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. You know, when, it read, it, when you read this carefully, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. Who's him? Sin? Is sin actually a him? A person? A noun? I think it's very possible, according to some extra-biblical texts, sin is the name of a devil, a demon, if you will, a devil, 
a fallen angel, a, a, a satanic spirit. So would that make sense if it said, Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him? Possibly. I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying this is true. I'm just throwing it out there. You take it any way you want. Uh, I take things not only with a grain of salt, but uh, sometimes I bring the whole salt shaker, just to be sure, you know. Now, if you know what happened in Genesis 6, and also after that, when there were giants in the earth in those days, well, if sin was a fallen angel, and the Canaan, you know, Ham and Canaan got involved with all that mess, you know, I mean, God told him to go into the land of Canaan and kill everything that breathes. Kill everything that breatheth. There is a reason for that. He didn't say send evangelists in there to, you know, tell them to clean up their acts and fly right. No, he didn't say that. He said, go in and kill everything that breatheth. There's a reason why the... Uh, the Israelites were at war with the Philistines. You know, Goliath. Yeah. God didn't tell David to, to go there and preach the gospel to him. No. So let's go to Genesis 10 and verse 15. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the archite and the sinite, S I N I T, sinite. I wonder if that's any, if that's a connection with uh, what we just read, you know, Genesis 4 7. Sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm not trying to grasp at straws. I'm just kind of showing you some things that are in scriptures. I'm not saying it's true. I'm not saying it's not true. Because to be honest with you, I'm not sure. But uh wouldn't surprise me. Because the fallen angels wanted to pollute the bloodlines of God's people. And when you read about what uh, Big Pharma is trying to do with this uh, beer cure that they call, I've heard that it will uh, alter DNA. Now, I don't think, uh, I'm not, sh I don't believe, I should say that. I'm not 100% sure either way. It may not affect our, our salvation, but if it alters the DNA of future generations, that's not going to be a good thing. I mean, God put his mark of ownership on us with, his, with the DNA, and yet the devils want to, want to change it. You know, they always try to get the Canaanites to intermarry with the children of Israel. They did it with Esau. They did it in the days of, oh, let's see. I think in the days of Joshua. They did it. They've always been doing it. Uh, let's see. Balaam and Balak, if you know that story. He taught the uh, women to seduce the Israelite men, which really was not a hard thing to do. And uh, read the book of Ezra, chapter 9. We just read that. I just did that as a Bible study. Not good. Not good at all. Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. 
And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain, Cain, raising Cain, right? That Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Uh, it's not my day to watch him, Lord. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Wow. Keep that in mind. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. We'll probably read that in a little bit later because I'm going to make a point on this. Verse 11. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. The wanderer, right? Uh, Cain's Cain and some claim that it's Cain's descendants, all his descendants, have the curse of Cain. They would never be able to till the ground and receive the strength of the earth. In other words, they plant fruits and vegetables and nothing, you know, maybe the plant would grow, but it would never fruit. They would never get a harvest. So they'd be fugitives and vagabonds. The wandering you-know-who, right? So what kind of an... If this, was, if this curse was passed on to the whole lineage of Cain, and if they survived the flood, what kind of occupations do you think Cain's descendants would have to be? Um, how about merchants? They would probably have to be buyers and sellers of things. You know, they buy things from the farmers to sell to whoever, right? Um, merchants, manufacturers. How about banks and banking and insurance? Yeah. And you know, one of the... One of the most heart-touching things I can ever think of is when they have people go over to the Israeli state and they have that campaign for tr plant a tree for Israel. Yeah. You know, they've had American congressmen and presidents go over there and they, they plant a tree for Israel. Isn't that lovely? How come they don't do it themselves? Hmm. Think about that for a couple minutes. Yeah, they have other people do it for them. Plant a tree for Israel. So, when you till the ground, you ain't going to get nothing, Jack. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, Oy vey, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now, what's this about blood? All right, so what's the big deal about blood crying out? Leviticus 17 and verse 14. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, 
Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Deuteronomy 12.23 Only be sure that thou eat not the blood. For the blood is the life, and then thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. Leviticus 17.11 For the life of the flesh is in the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your son, souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Blood is... We weren't to... Uh, we're not supposed to mess around with blood, huh? Now, the thing is, what you know? what's Hollywood have? Oh, yeah. Vampires, they live forever. Why? Because they drink blood. Can anybody say adrenochrome, anybody? Uh, what do these elites do with all these children? I don't even like to think about it. Because if it was up to me, there'd be a lot less children getting kidnapped every year because I would get rid of the source of the kidnappings. But uh, I'm just one person and I wouldn't get very far. I wouldn't even know where to start. So how important was blood? Well, in Jesus in John 6, 54 said, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, yeah, but that was uh, symbolically. So what is this deal about the life, uh, the blood crying out from the earth? Well, in John 6, 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Very interesting. I've actually been to sites where uh, they say that Jesus was the first vampire. I want to suck your blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I used to, uh, I don't know, 15 so odd years ago, I used to go to, uh, I used to go to a lot of dark sites and uh, try to preach, well, not preach, but plant some Bible verses and stuff. You know, the children of the night, they probably never really heard the true gospel. I'm sure not, because, you know, the churches have been teaching garbage for since the days of Billy Graham and before. But they've been, they were really bad after World War II. Really bad. Matter of fact, I was, uh, Oh, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago I was watching a, well, not really watching a movie, but there was a movie on, I guess maybe I was flipping through the channels or whatever. It was a movie made in the 40s, the late 40s, after World War II, and um, they were in the Pacific, and uh, there was a, an attack by the Japanese on the American ship, and a number of men had been killed. And the chaplain, they actually had a military burial with, the, with them at sea. And I was shocked that they were actually quoting the Bible, Book of Revelation, about the, the, uh, the sea would give up her dead in the resurrection. I mean, I was like, my mouth was open. This was like, a, you know, 1948 somewhere around there, you know, because when they started with the Billy Graham, Billy Goat Graham stuff, look out. Churches have been going downhill since those days. But I was really shocked. All right, so let's take a look at something. Now, what did it mean when it said that the uh, 
the blood crieth from the earth. Well, let's use the Bible to try to interpret the Bible. At least I, I try to do that. Sometimes you got to fill in the blanks because a little bit of logic. But let's go to the New Testament. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Perhaps you've heard this. Uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Abraham's bosom. Luke 16 and verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Now remember, purple was the color of royalty. He had fine clothing, fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day, which means he ate well. He wasn't uh, eating beans and rice, I guarantee you. Verse 20, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. In other words, the rich man didn't offer him a plate of food every day. I, it doesn't appear that way to me. You know, oh, a piece of bread fell off the table. Eh, I guess we'll throw that to the dogs and Lazarus, you know. And it came to pass, verse 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels do you know that when you die, you're carried by the angels? Huh. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, there's three words that they translate as hell. One of them is grave. And the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists and all, uh, probably the Christadelphians and a few of the others, they'll, they'll look at the first definition and say, grave. See, that's hell. You just go into the grave and that, that's it. And you're asleep. And then, you know, it's like Christmas Eve and... You know, you go to sleep on Christmas Eve, and when you wake up, it's Christmas morning because you've just been resurrected, and then everybody gets their present. Uh, and they'll tell you that this is a, a parable. But Jesus didn't say this is a parable. He said, and there was a rich man. And there was. And he's calling Lazarus by name. Okay? It's not a parable. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham. Now how could he say Father Abraham? He must have been a child of Abraham. He must have been one of Abraham's children. Now, Abraham had two children. He had Ishmael, and he had Isaac, which was the chosen seed. And I have a feeling he was of Isaac, but I can't prove it. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And you know what? Even if this was a parable, he's talking about being tormented in the flame. Yeah. But Abraham said, Son, ah, oh, Abraham didn't tell him, I, Oh, I don't know who you are. No, Abraham acknowledges that he's a son of Abraham. He's one of his children. 
But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. So there's some kind of divide here. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. So Abraham's bosom evidently is a compartment in hell minus the flames. At least that's how I look at it. I mean, I don't hear Abraham complaining about, you know, being burned up. And besides, he says, uh, but now he, Lazarus, is comforted and thou art tormented. So Lazarus is comforted and the rich man is being tormented. Verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him unto my father, uh, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place a torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he, Abraham, said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So, where was Abel? Abel was probably the first person to go to the what they now call what they called what they called Abraham's bosom he was probably the first one there being separated from the Lord awaiting the Messiah the Christ is that what it mean by well, let's go back to Genesis 4. Verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, The Lord, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Ah, is that what that means? Very, very possible. The life is in the blood. Abel was probably in the compartment of hell, crying that he was separated from his mother and father and asking for vengeance. All right, let's... Uh, so whatever happened to this uh, Abraham's bosom place? Well, let's go to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 12. I guess we'll start in verse 34 because I don't want to make this a super long study. Um, I've got a... I'll cover the high points, but if anybody wants to uh, get in a little more detail about this, I've got another study on it. Probably a lot of the same material, but uh, just from a slightly different angle. All right, Matthew 12, 34, Jesus speaking. O generation of vipers. Now, that's not a very nice thing to say. Uh, what would Jesus do? Uh, oh, no, and, you know, WWJD. How about what did Jesus do? Uh, called some evil people a generation of vipers. That's what Jesus did. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. 
and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. And that includes me, boy. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of idle words that I'm going to have to give an account of one day. And uh, those that teach Bible stuff, we're extra accountable. Extra. That's a scary thing. Most, most of your preachers, I guess they just don't care or they don't believe this. I mean, I, I just, I don't get it. I've actually talked to some preachers, well, at least one, that I, I was talking about some stuff that um, I don't remember what. It might have been the preacher of rapture. And he even said, well, yeah, I know you're right, but he says, if I, if I changed a thing uh, and taught them, you know, what you're talking about, he says, they'd kick me out of here and I'd have no job. So I tell them what they want to hear. And I'm like, wow. So I guess the job was more important than teaching them the truth and trusting in the Lord to supply his needs, right? Uh, that's just my, my guess, so. Verse 37, Jesus said, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now remember, the Bible, Jesus just said in the Bible that uh, by our words we'd be justified, and by our words we'd be condemned. How about this for a kicker? Matthew 10, 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, now this is Jesus speaking, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So if we deny Christ before men, Christ will deny us before his Father. By our words, we'll be justified, and by our words, we shall be condemned. Uh, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees, certain, obviously not all of them, certain ones, scribes and the Pharisees, you're talking about Jews, and they, uh, they, and they answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Yeah, we want to see a magic trick or a miracle, you know. Verse 39, But he answered and said unto them, Listen to this, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of, of the prophet Jonas. That's the Greek rendering of Jonah. You know, Jonah and the whale. You know, uh, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, but he went in the opposite direction. And then there was a big storm, and uh, Jonah said, Well, throw me in the ocean, and the, you know, the ship will be saved. And then uh, it threw him in the ocean, and then a, a big fish swallowed him up, probably a whale. And then that fish spit him up on the seashore of the land leading to Nineveh. Can you imagine the, the uh, fish worshippers? Uh, Nineveh and Assyria had a fish god named Dagon. Looked like uh, the little mermaid's daddy. It was a man from the waist up and a fish from the 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 waist down, look like the little Disney's Little Mermaid. Yeah. So the fishermen are on the, the beach fishing, and then this whale pops up and spits this guy out. And I'll guarantee you, they probably, 
what, what were the first words out of Jonah's mouth? Repent. And, and they probably followed him all the way to the capital, which was Nineveh. And uh, Jonah preached repentance. And the Bible records they listened. So, you know, the sign of the prophet Jonas, three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Verse 40. But the sign of the prophet Jonas, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Um, okay. What happened when Jesus was crucified? They put him in the tomb, right? And on the third day, he rose again, right? Oh, it's... Uh, Bob, are you sure about that? Oh, I'm pretty sure. Let's check it out. All right, Matthew 16, 21. And from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Three days and three nights in the whale's belly, Jesus would be died, be buried, and on the third day, raised again, resurrected, right? Matthew 17, 23. And they shall kill him, and the third day shall he be raised again, and they were exceeding sorry. Matthew 20, 19. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Um, who's these Gentiles? They'll always tell you, oh, well, that was be the Romans. You know what? I don't think so. I think it was the Pharisees. I think some of the Pharisees were uh, Edomites, Esau, Idumeans. I think they were the so-called Gentiles here. Because Pilate wanted nothing to do with the crucifixion of Jesus. Pilate tried to release him. But the uh, Pharisees wouldn't have, no, they wouldn't have it, no, uh-uh. Now in Luke 13, 32, and he said unto them, um, well, give you a little background. The Pharisees and the were uh, telling Jesus, you better run out of here because Herod's going to kill you. You know, they were trying to scare him off. I'm paraphrasing, of course. That's, you know. But in uh, Luke 13, 32, eh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll read it in context. This way nobody says, I don't know what I'm talking about here. Luke 13, 31. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, obviously not all of them, just certain ones, saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he, Jesus, said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox. Now, obviously, he wasn't complimenting Herod on his attractiveness. No. No. You know, the fox guarding the hen house, that kind of a the sly fox. Go ye and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. The third day perfected. Think about that. He's going to be resurrected in his new body, not the flesh and blood body. 
Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. So on the third day, I shall be perfected, he said. So there you go. All right, so in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, and that he, Jesus, was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. All right. All right, so if Jesus rose up on the third day, what was he doing for those, you know, what was he doing for those two days? I mean, if Jesus was killed, crucified and killed, and his body was laid in the, the grave, what was he doing when he was dead? I mean, you know, uh, Abraham was dead, Lazarus was dead, the rich man was dead, and they were having a conversation with each other. W what was Jesus doing for the time that he was dead, before his resurrection on the third day? What was he doing? Good question, Bob. Do you have an answer? Well, I think so. Hold on a second here. Let's take a look. All right, let's take a look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That word answer, uh, it's from a Greek word. It's where we get the word apology from. Have you ever heard the term apologetics? Well, that's where it comes from. Uh, first time I heard that, they were like, apologetics. Oh, yeah, that's where you, uh, your, uh, it's a, a branch of theology where you're attempting to prove that the scriptures are true. It doesn't mean you're saying, oh, I'm sorry for being a Christian. In the, no, no, you're, that's not what it means. It means to give an answer. So, you know, when somebody says, well, how do you know that Jesus rose on the third day? Oh, well, there were many eyewitnesses that uh, died for their faith. You know, uh, was there mass hallucinations? You know, you had the 12 apostles, you had other people, people that saw him, uh, and they were put to death rather than deny what they'd saw. I mean, you know, and then there's people who think, oh, well, you know, they were smoking peyote, or they took too much opium, or they got too high on some weed, or they were dropping acid, or, you know, something. That's that's what they, that's what the... Uh, satanic ones want you to believe but now these people they know what they saw they saw christ risen from the dead the guy that had been beaten and whipped and beaten and and crucified who had a spear put in his side and then they'll tell you oh well you know he was just he was just kind of hurt, and then he was in the grave for three days, and then he, you know, he healed up and got better, and then he crawled out of the grave, and, you know, the, the, the grave, and then, you know, walked around, and everybody was thinking, oh, he came back from the dead. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. They call that the swoon theory. I don't think so, buddy boy. You can believe that if you want, but uh, I believe that it says that... Uh, Christ is going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. So, be always ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you accuse your good conversation in Christ. Well, I know about that. Verse 17. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing 
than for evil doing. Yeah, good idea. Better to be uh, thought of as a child molester than to actually be one, right? You know, these uh, clergy that purposely do that stuff, casting filth upon the name of the church and of Christ, may the Lord give them ten fold the reward of the what the rich man got in hell for it is better if the will of god be so that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing for christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Verse 19, listen carefully. By which also he went and preached, preached unto the spirits in prison. What prison did Christ go and preach unto the spirits in prison? by which he, Christ, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What was, what, was, what was Abraham's bosom? You know, when, when Adam and Eve fell, they, uh, they were separated from God. It was a prison. He wasn't preaching to their bodies because their bodies were buried and gone. So what was he preaching to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Lazarus, to Abel, Adam and Eve, all the Old Testament saints, Moses, Elias, Samuel, David, Samson, Solomon. They all went to Abraham's bosom, didn't they? Stands to reason. So what did Christ do for three days? He went to Abraham's bosom and preached unto the spirits in the prison. Let's keep reading. Verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. I am guessing that all the Old Testament saints, when they were, they were, they were taken up into heaven with Christ. That's what I'm guessing. Is there any proof text for that? Let's take a look. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Yeah, we're going to read Paul. You know, that guy that the, those Hebrew roots people hate? Yeah, they hate Paul. And they hate the guy that sent Paul, which is Jesus. They, they don't even like his name. They don't even like the name of Jesus. Oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a Greek name. And you know, Jesus was not Greek. He was Hebrew. And there's no J and in the English language, so it couldn't possibly be Jesus, and blah, 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 blah. Oh, boy, I'll tell you. I've heard, I think I've almost heard it all. I can't say I've heard it all, because every, every once in a while I hear something weird, and I'm like, what the? Never mind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called 
with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Spirit, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all and in you all. Verse seven, and unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Verse eight, wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive. And gave gifts unto men. He led captivity captive. Uh, what was what was captivity? Hell in Abraham's bosom. Did Christ lead captivity captive? Verse nine. Listen to this. Now that he ascendeth, which means to go up. Now that he ascendeth, what is it? But that he also descended, which means to go down, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Huh. So first he went down and then he went, he ascended. He went, descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Why? To take captivity captive, to preach to the Old Testament saints, right? Now that, uh, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Are you getting the idea now? He led captivity captive. All right, let's take a look at Luke 23, Jesus is being crucified. Verse 38. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek. Why does it say Greek first? Why does it say Greek first? That's not a coincidence, people. Greek was the common language of the day of Christ. Um... Rome had only come like 30 years earlier. Well, I mean, 30 years before Christ had been born, approximately, give or take, you know. 30 years before Christ was born, Rome came in and took over the area. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. In other words, we're, you know, we're worthy of what we're being crucified for. But, you know, what did Jesus do? Nothing. He didn't do anything to deserve this. That's the Bob translation. Verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord. Ah, he acknowledged Jesus as Lord. He also acknowledged that Jesus had done nothing worthy of death. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Um, does Abraham's bosom sound like paradise? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think they took him up to heaven with them. Is there another witness to this? Well, let's take a look. 
You see, before Christ and after Christ, things were very, very different. All right, how about Genesis, uh, no, I'm sorry, not Genesis, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6 and verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So, death and hell, power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, war, and with hunger, famine, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Are these four-legged beasts? Or are they two-legged beasts? Verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. What altar? The altar of God. The altar of the Lord. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Wow, there's souls under the altar of the Lord that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Verse 10, and they cried. Remember, Abel's blood cried out. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Why are these people not in Abraham's bosom? Because Christ took captivity captive and ascended into heaven. And, and I'm sure he took all those that believed on Christ, all the righteous, and took them to heaven with him. At least, that's what I believe. And the rich man, he's still in the flames, wanting somebody to tip his finger in the water and cool his tongue. Is there another witness? Well, let's take a look. How about we go to Gen uh, Revelation? Why do I keep saying Genesis? Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. Why is he called an old serpent? Because he'd been around for a long, long time. You know, when the serpent was talking to Eve? Oh, yeah. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. I've had people tell me that the devil and Satan are two different beings. Uh, no. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Huh. He saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Now, people, they're in heaven. 
So where does he see? You know, I, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Ah, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Uh, tell that somebody tell that to the pre-tribbers because this totally the first resurrection doesn't happen until the end of the tribulation when Christ returns. There's not a resurrection at the beginning of the tribulation, which which is what they teach. Verse six. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And the thousand years, people, is only the introduction. Think about that. So, do you understand why Abel's blood cried out from the ground? He was probably in Abraham's bosom, and he'd been there for probably over 3,000 years waiting for the Messiah to come. Was King David looking for a redeemer? How about Psalm 1610? For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. What? For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. How about Acts 2.27? Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Ah, Acts 2.27 quotes Psalm 16.10. King David knew that he would not have his soul left in hell forever. He knew that. And as an ending verse, let's go to the book of Job. Uh, some people say, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible, and there was a while I didn't believe that, but I do now. So let's go to Job chapter 33, and we'll look at verse 28. He will deliver his soul from going into the pit. What's the pit? Hell, right? Or the grave and his life shall see the light lo all these things worketh God oft times oftentimes with man to bring back his soul from the pit huh to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living Isn't that amazing? He will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, these, uh, lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. See, even in the beginning, the Lord made provisions for our, for our fall. I mean, after all, the Bible records that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Here are some uh, nice things. 1 Peter 1 and verse 20 who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Oh, yeah. 
You want to read some, uh, you know, these people that say that we weren't, um, they don't believe in election. They don't think God makes a choice. Well, take a look at Ephesians 1.4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Wow. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now I ask you a question. Did Jesus pick the apostles or did the apostles pick Jesus? You know, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Oh, yeah. Revelation 13 and verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Christ was to be the Lamb, who was to be slain from the foundation of the world. Um, and we were chosen... So we should walk in holiness and righteousness. And I'm a hypocrite because I need to take my own advice. Trust me. Trust me. I know. All right. Well, I hope that uh, you found this interesting. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In the name of Jesus, amen.